Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to join in conversations with guests, special guests, and people in, in our music world. Today I have a really special guest, a, a musician, producer, who, who did Shania O'Connor's uh, great, great song. And, and you know, it's, it's, we've, we've lost another great one. But here's this conversation. I'm really happy that he, he happens to be in town. Mr. Chris Bir Birkett. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, you got it right. Most people say Burkett. Burkett. But it's actually Burkett. You I was just it. about to say Burkett, but it's you Burkett? Got it right. Yeah. Ah, Hi, folks. <laughs> I'm here in Montreal with yeah. Aldo. So yes. <laughs> but be before we start talking about shaping your journey, let me just take you back to the very beginning. What started it? What started the music? What was that spark that got you going? Um, how much time have we got? <laughs> oh, we got all, all day. <laughs> a long story. Well, I'll, make, I'll give you the short version. So basically I I was kind of born to play guitar, and uh, but I didn't come from a musical family. So when I was eight years old, I was so desperate to make sound with an instrument that I, I rummaged around in the garbage and found some wood and nailed together my first ever guitar. And uh, I got some, my dad found some, somebody with some banjo strings, so I stuck them on there, you know. So I was able to make music at the age of eight. And then when I was 12, I saved up every penny I could find and got my first proper guitar, which is a kind of a Fender Stratocaster copy at the time, it's called a Top 20 from Japan. And it looked just like a Strat, but it didn't sound like a Strat, but, you know. But that was, uh, I was able to get in my, stay in my room, keep out of trouble, you know. Most of my friends, I, I grew up in a really poor area just outside london most of my friends are out there you know getting into trouble getting arrested and i was at home learning uh deep purple and led zeppelin you know stuff on my guitar i was just really mad about music i just wanted to do that that's how i started and then did you take music lessons or did you just uh, no I, unfortunately my my dad did not really uh see eye to eye with me i did an electronics degree when i left school i left school a year early and that joined the Royal Aircraft Establishment as an electronic engineer. But I didn't really want to do that, but my, my dad wanted me to do it, right? But I was all the time I was playing in the local band in the evenings. And uh, and then one night, Deep Purple came to play at my college while I was studying. And I uh, was standing right in front of Richie Blackmore and he's playing the solo to Highway Star. And I had my first epiphany. I said, I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna be an electronic engineer, I wanna be that guy. And that's, yeah. a, that's, that's the time, that's the real changing point. You know, we have these epiphanies to our life, which just you get like a crossroads and you decide to do something completely different. I got on the train the next day and just went to London. I was 19 years old and I just got, I just slept on the streets. I had nowhere to live and I couldn't go back home because my dad was really angry at me for, you know, for leaving. And uh, I just uh, got, went to every audition I could go to. And then one night I was in a gas station because I had to make money to buy food right so i was doing a night shift in a gas station and uh this band came in and said are you chris burkett the guitar player i said yeah that's me and said, somebody had recommended me and uh, they said well we got an 18 month tour of germany and we need a guitarist do, do you want the job and i said yeah i'd love to do that thank you and i said when do we start you know thinking it was like you know two or three weeks ahead. <laughs> Tomorrow morning at seven, we're getting the ferry. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. So I had to quit my job. You know, as soon as the boss came in, just get in the back of the truck and off we went. Yeah. That's a movie. That's a movie. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it, wow. it was another crossroads, you know. I mean, what I learned from all this is that uh, you get these opportunities in life which involve a certain amount of risk, you know, because in fact, when I was working at the gas station, I just got started my own apartment. I had first time my in you know a year i had anywhere to live right. so i could have just thought well i can't give this up now you know but i took it i took a chance and i was yeah. finding in life if you if you take it take a chance and push yourself beyond your own self-imposed barriers you actually things start to open up for you it's almost like the universe helps you because you're yeah. trying you know yeah no no you're absolutely right and you know what i always say and, I, and people who have watched my show is i don't believe in coincidences i mm -hmm. mean you you shape your journey this is about shaping your journey yeah. and this those decisions that you make and none of none of the decisions are really wrong but the results are different yeah. so you yeah. take that decision you, like what came up for you 
and one, one step brings the other. You could also say, no, I want to stay here. I've got my apartment. I'm good. Yeah. I'm probably, as a, probably a Chris Burkett in a parallel universe, which is still working in the gas station. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, those people are important too. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. of course, we need everybody. I mean, we're all important as well. But uh, um, I mean, I, I, I always say music really saved my life because I was so depressed sometimes in my life, especially when I was homeless and I, had no, and I couldn't go back to my family and, and had nothing. Uh, you know, I felt suicidal sometimes, but it was the music that really j just fed me and kept me kept me alive spiritually. And, uh, you know, if your spirit is alive, then the rest of it follows, right? You know, we're material, we're spirit beings in material bodies. And if you get, if you've got that glow, that light, everything else falls into place. You can even heal yourself from, uh, you know, illness if you believe you can do it. Yep. And I have stories about that in, in India. I was, I was in India studying um, Diksha, so teaching. And I had, uh, I went down with what you call Gandhi's revenge. You know, I got food from a, a, a street vendor okay. after I'd finished my work at this university where I was learning Diksha. And I, I was laying in my hotel in absolute agony. And I was, this thing was eating into my, I felt I was going to, I just wanted to die. It was so painful. And then I'd, I'd been learning about the suffering being in perception you know the, this idea that suffering is in the suffering we do is in our perception. We can we can complain that the rose bushes have thorns, or we can rejoice that the thorn bushes have roses. It's the same event, but a different perception, right? So I was learning this in India. I thought, why don't I try this idea on this this you know this thing that I feel is killing me with pain? Right. So instead of pushing the pain away, I embraced it as an experience. And I just breathed in as much light as I could. And I've been taught to do this at the, at the Oneness University. And suddenly, literally, without any exaggeration, in five minutes, I got up off that bed and I, without any pharmaceuticals, I was cured. I just walked free. I was, was it gone because I believed I could do it. Sure. And that's how, that's how placebo works. You know, it works on faith. Sure. So. Well, you said, you said the magic word. It's faith. Yeah. If you believe it, it can be done. If you see it, if you conceive it, and if you... Uh, can visualize it also it, it is because it is because you believe it then, then it is sometimes you have to do extra steps to make it happen but i've always believed that and and it's it's funny i, I always thought because i think and i see it in three dimension i hear the the end already right so then i just work backwards so how does that work so if you if you believe it i mean i was a kid and also in a i was born in a little village in calabria you know with no shoes and yeah and then when I go back there, because I bought a house, I was just there actually recently. And they say, well, how did you do that? I said, well, you know, you, you just make up your mind. And of course, there's work to do. Yeah, and you've probably got still loads of friends who are still in the same life. In, oh, in your oh, yes. Village, right? oh, yes. So you're the one that stepped out and took chances. Yeah, I had, I had opportunity, but we all have opportunity if yeah. we just step out. If you stay home. Yeah. And you do nothing. Well, guess yeah. what? If you, if you nothing happens. If you stay in your comfort zone, <laughs> then pretty sure that actually nothing's going to move for you. So you have to step outside your comfort sure. zone. No, no, you bring on a really, yeah. really good point, and it's and that's what it is. If you really believe it, you want it, it gets done because mm -hmm. all those things that you believe are obstacles, they're just tests. They just say, do you see it or you do not see it? Yeah. Now you just go around it, or you stand there and say, well, I'm going to wait till this wall moves. <laughs> well, King Canute, sure. King Canute tied that with the sea, but it didn't really work. So I don't think he had faith. Yeah. He didn't have enough faith. And and then like the the engineering. I mean, you're you're a guitar player, and like the engineering producing. How did that? Because I was curious. I said, how did this musician end up working with um, Quincy Jones? Working with mm. some oh, of these yeah. other. Uh, well, Quincy Jones recorded one of my songs, uh, "Kiss of Life." It's for Saida Garrett's debut album. Okay. The girl that works for Michael Jackson. So that's how I got to work with him. But uh, uh, essentially, it was, I, was, uh, I was mentored and taught by Tony Visconti, who's uh, David Bowie's producer, right. and Mark Boland, and Moody Blues, and all those people, right? So he, he um, cutting into the story a little bit shorter, but he, I, I was, uh, when I came back from Germany, uh, I was looking for another gig. So I went to every audition I could go to and I got a gig with a band called Love Affair and they just had a huge hit with Everlasting Love. Have you ever heard that song? Open up your eyes, then you realize. Of course, of course. Here I stand with my Yay. everlasting love. You know, so, so I mean, I don't, it's not my kind of music, but it's a good pop song. But anyway, they, they asked me to, I went to an audition, they asked me to join and the bass player of that band 
after being with them for a year or two, he said, I just heard of a band that's just been signed to a huge deal with Tony Visconti's Good Earth Records via RCA, and they're looking for a guitar player. So, of course, I you know, ran along to the audition, and they asked me to join. So I got to work with, the, with one of the best producers in the world, and uh, I was a complete nuisance. I was constantly asking him, how did you get that sound, Tony? How did you do that? You know, I was asking him questions. So he's kind of my mentor. Okay. And then I, after that project kind of collapsed because his, his label folded due to corruption with his partner. It's another story he won't go into. But I, 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 uh, another story. Uh, yeah, it's the, guy, yeah. the guy brought a whole uh, a club called Stringfellas with our royalties. From our from our band, which is interesting, but anyway, there's, I won't tell you too much about that. But anyway, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of sharks in the music business, and there still are. Right? Yes, uh, yes. So so Tony's, uh, I decided to open my own studio in London, and I bought my first house, and I, I built a studio in the garage at the bottom of the garden, and that's when I started working with Sinead O'Connor and people like that, you know, and uh, we did uh, nothing compares to you that and the the album I do not want what I haven't got. And uh, I got a call from Billboard magazine one day and they phoned me and said, uh, Chris, uh, your studio has been rated as the second best studio in the world. I said, I was totally shocked. And they said, tell me about it. I said, well, I said, it's just a potting shed at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> <laughs> but it's who's, well, no, it, who's I, behind the machine. Well, I just, right. I, I had the potting shed knocked down and I got my friends to build me a soundproof, you know, space. That's right. where I did a lot of my recording. But I made a lot of hit records in there, and, it, and it's it's nice. down to it's down to what you put. You know, it's not the equipment; it's who's using it, right? Exactly. So I had yeah. to feel. I was a very musical engineer. I started as an engineer first, after working with Tony, and then I got I got very successful as an engineer. Everybody was calling me to do stuff, but I was very musical because I've so, always been a songwriter, so that really helped a lot. Right. I wasn't just a guy watching meters, you know, and right. looking at frequencies, you know, it's yes. something else. So, so that was a good combination, and that's partly why I got so busy. And then I decided to take the leap from engineer to producer, mostly because I was being, I felt I was being abused. I wasn't getting credited properly for my work, and I, I used to put a lot of work into helping people arrange this stuff. And uh, never really get any thanks for it, you know. So you're not, uh, not given the, the credits for well, the arrangements? Well, I'll give you an example. I was, uh, I was working at a studio called Tapestry. I was the in-house engineer. It was owned by a character called John Congress. Well, one day uh, Mutt Langer came to the studio working with uh, Def Leppard. Right. And Mutt, uh, John Congress was one of these inherited rich guys, right? His mum owned a chain of hotels in South Africa, right? So he's really wealthy. He brought, he was the first one along with Pete Townsend to buy the Fairlight. It was the first sample sampler. Right. Monophonic, 8-bit, but all computer language, MCL. It wasn't MIDI, before the days of MIDI. Mutt Langer phones up and said, I want to use the Fairlight in the new Def Leppard album. Pyromania, the album was called. I want the latest technology. So we had all these wicked samples. He'd spent hours recording snare drums and kick drums, right? So my job was to take the drummer's uh, ideas, which he gave me a tape of what he wanted to play on the songs, write them out in score, and then put them into music composition language. It's really complicated. It's not like today. It's dead easy to program drums, but but it was very hard. It had to be done one instrument at a time. And wow. Mutt would sit there. We'd sit in the studio for a whole day listening to a click against the hi-hat. Is it slightly ahead? No. Is it slightly behind? It's just, just, it just drove me nuts. <laughs> I, you know. I mean, I, I haven't got, I've got a lot of patience, but I, I don't, I'm not, I wouldn't spend that much time on what I think is unnecessary detail. But anyway, we got a really good, um, you know, drum tracks eventually. He went off with the tapes to do the guitars and vocals. And six months later, he called me and said, uh, we have to do the drums again. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I've, I transferred the 24-track analog tapes like four times now, and I want first-generation drums. But luckily, I had everything saved. But we still had to go through the painful process of re-recording everything right, again, right. you know, against the click and everything. So uh, anyway, I didn't get any credit for that because the, the, obviously the band did not want to know that the drummer wasn't playing on the record. So stuff like that, which made me decide to leap from engineering and programming into uh, pro producing, so I, you know, get credited properly. Well, have you, I mean, being the producer, I mean, one, of, I mean, the, our favorite producer, one of my favorites, certainly is George Martin. What he did with the Beatles and 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 mm, Jeff Beck. Him. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Jeff Beck, when I heard the Jeff oh, Beck yeah. Wired album. Oh, Jeff Beck's my favorite yeah. ever guitar player. He's so great. George Martin, yes, because he was I'll, like... Yeah, I'll give you my George Martin. God in, in, in producing. Well, I was producing and writing songs with a, a punk singer okay. called John Otway. And we wrote a song back in the seven, an album called All Balls and No Willie. It's not swearing. It's because it's <laughs> his partner okay. was Wild Willie Barrett and they split up. So Willie left. So there was no Willie. So, oh, and, and okay, okay. Lots of, you know, so, so we did that. And then years later, just, just a few years ago, 2017, I think it was, he called me up and he, he said, I'd like you to produce my new album. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And, and, write, and write some songs with him. So we had a, he had a really good band, great rock, rock band. They're awesome. They played in Toronto. Few years ago, really good. Anyway, uh, he said we're recording the album in Montserrat in George Martin's house in Jamaica, right? And, yeah, it's near Jamaica. It's right. one of the out, out, this in the Caribbean, right? Yes, yes. So I so I had to take my uh, portable Pro Tools rig and some speakers over there, and it's, it's kind of complicated, but because they didn't have much. Now we would have recorded it at George's Air Montserrat, but it had been destroyed by a hurricane. Remember, we wanted yeah. to see it, and it's you know Sting. Paul McCartney, the Stones, they all recorded there. But yeah. it was just when I when I went to we went to look at it, it was destroyed, you know. It's just water coming in the roof and it's finished. So we went to George's house, which is called uh Olverston House on Penny Lane. It's, it's, he, they obviously made the, the name of the street after him, right? And uh I got to because I was the producer, I got to sleep in George's bed for a whole month. So so that's why George Martin's story. As yeah. most the, the fairy dust from George Martin's twinkled down, and we got a really great album out of it. It's really nice. good. It's called Montserrat, the album. Check it out. It's John Otway. Yes. I mean, there's another great studio. I mean, the Montserrat studio, Martin's studio, was one of the great world studios. There was the one here in uh, just outside Montreal, Le Studio, you know. You know oh, that I, know. One. I know he had Air London in Oxford Street. I worked there with Tony. We did uh, some strings there once, but... I didn't know he had a, a studio in Montreal. Oh, Pretty yes. Cool. Uh, and uh, David Bowie recorded there, one of his albums. Sting recorded there. Uh, Rush recorded most mm. of their albums there. Um, many, many. That was one of the, the big studios. It was, it was called Le Studio. It was yeah, one yeah. of the big studios. In Chicago, the, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. they didn't come there. And just take them. it over. It was in the mountains. It was beautiful. Is it still there? No. Okay. No, same. Uh, you know, at one point, I mean, the, the studios uh, didn't have the budgets, didn't, you know, the, that whole that whole thing. And uh, then it was abandoned. And and uh, Andre, who was the original owner of that, he was brilliant. He uh, he sold he sold that and and went into the video production of stuff, and then mm -hmm. opened up something in in the Bahamas or something. And then this whole transition when recording studios were uh, being replaced by the smaller machines as well yeah. i mean we all have studios i could you could make records at home now yeah it's, a kind of old, it's an old school concept right there, there are some big studios still going yes but like uh, i work out of revolution in toronto so it's, that's a that's like studio a is old school you know it's a big two two grand pianos big space for orchestra and stuff nice. but, but most of my work actually is done on a portable rig i travel all around the world i've, I've recorded in india and south africa and everywhere almost uh, just with a, a laptop running a Pro Tools system right. and uh, just some good mics. And I can actually go put it all in a backpack and travel wherever I want, So, sure. which is pretty cool. And it, it, obviously, you've got to find a nice space. Right. You don't want to be in an airport trying to record somebody's vocals. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's amazing what we can do. But, I mean, obviously, you have to be... That mind, the ears, and the, the knowing what to do with that material still yeah. is, I mean, the producer is the producer, the musician, or the, yeah. the, or the well, writer. Yeah, well, I, I kind of call myself more of an arranger. I mean, I am a producer, you know, known as a producer, but uh, I actually love the process of, I mean, people, during COVID, people just send me just a vocal, sometimes done on a phone, you know, singing into the voice memo, because they couldn't, we couldn't get together, right? Right. Uh, so I'd take that voice memo and I'd create a whole universe around it. And I did a lot of records like that. I just It's a lot of work because there's no, there's no tempo, there's no pitch, right? So you have to first decide what key they're in, roughly. And then you have to decide what, what, they're, what they're feeling as a tempo, what the groove is, you know, whether it's a swing or just straightforward or whatever. Once you found that out, you put it into, I put my, the vocal into Pro Tools and I chop it up. It takes sometimes 400 micro edits to get the vocals smack where it should be. And I, put, I use a program called Melodyne, 
which is a transparent vocal tuning program. I, don't, I never use auto tune because right. it sounds fake. And uh, I do. I use that with Buffy Saint Marie. All the vocals on her albums have been done with Melodyne, and she sings perfect. But you sometimes get have to just to pull that note down just a little bit or push it up, you know. So anyway, I, and I once I got the vocal in time, you know, in some sort of groove and in tune, it's very easy to put the music around it. It just comes, you know, it, it, it's calling out, you know, a, just somebody singing something is is telling you what should be on it. It's all it's already there. You know, you can hear it. So right, right. And I, I love doing that. I found it really creative. I did a lot of records like that. What uh, I mean, I, I, getting back to I was just thinking was as you were saying this when um, somebody like <clears throat> Sinead O'Connor, when that uh, song I know she played it on the on, on in your car. I heard the story. Um, <laughs> it's a famous story now, <laughs> but he, she insisted, and you said no, that's not a good song for you. Now, and that was Prince's song. That had he recorded it already? Yeah, it's been done by Prince, and it's also done by a band called Family. Okay. But they, the, the two versions, the previous versions, were not very interesting musically. And that's what I was talking about just now, about arranging. You can take a melody and you can do a hundred different things with it, but what you do underneath that melody makes a, a real difference into what... It, it's like sure. a vehicle, the vehicle to the melody. Like you can, you can change from, say, play, instead of playing a C major, you can play an A minor, you know, it's just a relative minor over the same melody, it completely changes the, the feeling of the song. Yeah. So that's what I do. And, the, and with Nothing Compares to You, we changed the chords and, you know, made it much more... In, I'm not downing Prince, he's a genius, but, yeah, but and the song itself, yes. the song was really very strong because it's lyrically a great song, which just really helps, you know. So you can... But the way he did it and the way Family did it, it was not really in, interesting. But the way we did it with Sinead was. But I have to say that song would not have been... A hit if it hadn't been for the video. The video really broke that song to internationally. So that's another thing. You know, we, you know, what's a hit song? You know, you know, it's, I got I got thousands of hit songs in my arsenal. But you know, it, it, you you have to find a way to get people to hear them. Sure. And the interesting thing is, and what I found, I mean, I was listening to the to Prince's original version, and then her her version of this, and I I really get it. I mean, what happened? Because I was thinking, what would have made that difference? Because obviously, Prince is great, and so is she. Um, but the the focus of the song wasn't uh, was a lot of instrumental, but the focus of of her version, what you did with her, mm. was especially the video. Yeah, because it's just the face. And the emotion that's going through that, and you yeah. don't have instruments in the beginning, right? Yeah, it's just, it's a very simple uh, arrangement. In fact, I didn't even put a bass on it. It's one of the few songs I've done without actually, without a bass line. Right. There's enough bottom coming from the the uh, string, program strings to kind of carry it, but it's all just a it's a very simple loop with a live hi hat and a great vocal performance. It's just like minimalistic. Yeah, and that's part of it. And it's got a few, ah, uh, you know, backing vocals, and that's about it. You know, it's a, it's a very simple. And that whole album I did with her took like six weeks to make. And Sinead was didn't like being in the recording studio. She she would get seriously bored. So so after two hours, she just want to go home. So <laughs> so so she came in one morning and just said, "I want to sing nothing compares to you today, Chris, if you don't mind." So, so I put my mic up and. Uh, uh, I use a uh, AKG four one four BULS on that song. This is my go to vocal mic because it's got a huge dynamic range, but it's really clear. And uh, Sinead has had um, what I call reverse mic technique, so it'd be like, "It's been seven hours, you know, fifteen days, nothing." You know, she'd, she'd, she'd get really close when it's loud and far away when it's right. quiet, which is completely not what you want, right? So it's really, diff <laughs> yes. so it's really difficult. That's the only mic actually that would, because the Neumanns okay. would just bottom out. And, right. And uh, so, we, but she just said, I want to sing it now. She sang it in one take. It's, uh, it's very rare. The only other singer I worked with who did one take vocals, which are excellent, was uh, Alison Moyer. I did a couple of her hits. And uh, she was really quick too. She's like, bang, done. You know, wow. That old devil called Love is number one for 11 weeks. Took me a day and a quarter to make that whole record. Wow. Wow. That's, the, that's that's a huge record. And that, that was a court, jazz quartet, banging it down on the first day, working out the arrangements. She came in the evening, sang the vocal, one take, and then the next morning I mixed it in about four hours and it's done. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, the best records are uh, usually really easy to make. 
Yes, and it's, and I mean it's not manufactured, it's not produced like produced in the sense taken apart and put back together. When it's really, especially a song like uh, nothing. Uh, comes close. I mean, nothing that, compares to you. <laughs> you. Sorry, nothing compares to you. Nothing right. compares. Sorry, <laughs> I mean, comes close. I was, think, I was jumping. It, call it, nothing comes close to you. That's nothing comes cool, close yeah. to you. Nothing comes in close in comparison to. to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm. I'm saying. I've like, got a better idea. We do. Nothing compares to me. That's that's for people who don't feel happy about themselves. How about that? <laughs> but it's amazing, like when you have this emotion, this idea, and you're and you're constantly on it. That's what I get when I say Sinead's uh, uh, version. She she pulls you into this 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 thing in the beginning, and there's no no other uh, abstractions. Yeah, nothing, and it's it's totally there. And she's singing this to you. Yeah, exactly. It's just a very Beautiful. simple uh, tri string triad, you know. It's actually key keyboard strings on that song, funny enough. And then just the vocal coming in. It's just, you know, it's just kind of worked. But but I have to tell you that I said this before, it's, it doesn't matter how good your song is, it's it's not going to happen unless, the, unless all the doors open in the right way. And that's what happened on that record. All the doors opened and it worked. It wasn't, you know, a thousand other artists could have done that song. And it never got heard of. Now, as I mentioned in one of my interviews, the BBC actually dropped dropped it. They they thought decided it wasn't going to be a hit. It went to forty two in the charts, right. and they said we're we're dropping it until the video came out, right. and that just broke everybody open because Sinead was thinking about her grandmother right. when she sang it, who's, who's the only person that had been nice to her, and she'd recently died while we were working together, and she was thinking about her when she sang the song. That's why she started crying, right? And that's uh. That's, it's that performance that sure, bro sure. broke it open. So there you go. It's just, just one little bit of magic that's just like made it happen. Sure, that it, everybody can relate to. And of course, mm. and it's real. I mean, that I think it's really important to be real. Yeah, and totally. When it's real, it's real. <laughs> yeah. And that makes the difference, I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. A another another uh, thought I had, like you were in, in London. Just check this out because I think my... Oh, it's okay. You came to, uh, to Toronto uh, at one point. And what what was that boat that took, <laughs> took you, <laughs> that door? Or? I told uh, I told Rick this story. I don't know if it, so anyway, um, the, the Toronto connection was. Um, I I produced an artist called Buffy Saint Marie, and I've been yeah, working with her. She's amazing. She I, is amazing. I did a comeback album, Coincidence and Likely Stories, back in 1992. We we're the first people to use the, the web to send. She was in Hawaii. I was in London. She sent her music. She said, I don't want to keep flying because it's jet lags. You know, it's 12 hours, right? She said, uh, can't we just kind of send you music and you start recording? And I said, okay. So, so we used modem and MIDI files, right? Wow. That's how it started. So anyway, there, there was a documentary made by Joan Prowse from Cinefocus Canada about, it's called Buffy St. Marie, a multimedia life. And Joan was phoning me all the time asking how I did, we did this early recording because it's featured on the documentary. And uh, so 2008 onwards, she, I was giving information about Buffy for this documentary. 2011, I think it was, or was it nine? No, 2009, uh, we released uh, the th Buffy's third album. It's called Running for the Drum. And the record label decided to put the documentary out as a double package with the album. And so I was playing guitar for Buffy in those days. And uh, we were at Massey Hall in Toronto, which is a big venue, for this big release. So so the lady that had done the documentary was there watching me on stage playing Buffy's set, right? So after the, after the show, came up to the green room and, and introduced herself. And then we stayed in contact, and that's how I ended up in... Uh, Toronto was was Kevin McKenzie. Yeah, he was, he was play, yeah. Kevin was playing drums. Uh, Roger Jacobs, I think, which is Buff, one of Buffy's old boyfriends, and Neil uh, Neil, Neil Chapman right. uh, was playing bass. Do you know Do you know who Neil Chapman is? Yes, he's actually a wicked electric guitar player. But I was playing electric guitar, and he was playing bass. Okay. <laughs> I had no idea how good he was, but if I did, I would have yeah. died, you know. I mentioned Kevin because he and I grew up in Ottawa. We had the same yeah. teacher. Oh, yeah. And he went to Toronto. I went to Montreal. And everybody was asking me, why did you go to Montreal? I love Montreal. But, mm. you know, it's a funny thing. You, you make those decisions and you always end up where you should be. Isn't that? Yeah. It, yeah. Isn't that funny? And yeah, Kevin McKenzie is a good drummer. Great yeah, drummer. I like, I like working with him. He's yes. really good, yeah. Great drummer, but in 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 the um, I mean, when you're working with someone like Buffy Saint Marie, who's so um, 
in, in, intense in what she does. I mean, she she's another one of those mm. real, <clears throat> real, and, and it's not just entertainment, this is the real deal. Yeah. And especially way before this whole uh, First Nations awareness that we're, I mean, fortunately, we're, we're all more aware of this mm. and this stuff, but she's been mm. on that mm. on that trail for a long time. Oh yeah, <clears throat> she was uh, blacklisted by the Nixon administration I for remember. talking about uh, you know issues like industrial military arms complex running everything and uranium mining on the reservations, killing you know making all the natives indigenous people sick. She was talking about that stuff well before anybody else did, and they 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 blacklisted her. They tried to get rid of her. It wasn't until 1992 that. Uh, she decided to come back, and that's when they contacted the record company, signed her, Nigel Grange of Ensign Records, and, they, and I was their producer. That's how I got to meet Buffy, through Ensign Records. And then on that album, Coincidence and Likely Stories, there's a song called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. It's about the Wounded Knee Massacre, you know, which happened, which we yes, all know yes. about now. But uh, that was that song was talking about her, her girlfriend being, you know, shot by the FBI for, because she was trying to tell people about the poison water that the going through the the, the the village, you know, right. natives dying of uranium poisoning and stuff. So she's been, she's a really, I call her a poet warrior. And so was uh, Sinead, actually. Sinead was a poet warrior too, because she would speak the truth about issues that people were not talking about in those days, you know, like, you know, inequality for women. Sure. You know, the, the label wanted her to be pretty girl, you know, long oh, hair and a short yeah. skirt, sexy. And she said, I'm not doing it. She's, you know, I'm, I'm going to have my hair sh head shaved. I'm not going to be wearing short skirts. Yes. And, uh, and that, was, that was standing up for, that's the first person, apart from the suffragette movement, obviously in the 30s, but she she was uh, one of the pioneers in for women standing up. And it's, it's now, you know, it's now more open. Thank God. It's like we have the Me Too and all that stuff, right? Uh, but women have been, females have been suppressed for thousands of years on this planet. In everything. I mean, it's just, it's just awful. And we have to, the, the pendulum is now swinging the other way, which of course, when pendulums swing, they reach extremes, you know, but we have to come down in the middle where there's total equality on this planet because we, we're, we're, we're way off. And that's one reason I, I believe that's one reason why we're not, we don't have full contact with the rest of the universe. We're, we're too barbaric. We're, da we're <laughs> yeah. dangerous. And yeah, uh, so I, that's so, a good one. I've got, right. a song, I've got a song which I'm going to release soon. It's called uh, we, Are, we Are Not The Only Ones, and it's about the ET contact, which, uh, which is Im imminent. But, you know, it's, uh, I'm very interested in that sort of stuff. So, And I put yeah. that in my music too. Interesting. I mean, that's, you know, I, I always, often I say, you know, I, in this day and age, and when I say this day and age, in the past 50, 100 years, we've come a long way as a human race. Mm. But in certain aspects... No, no, it's, we're still full still, of fear. These stories yeah. and these, I, you say that surely, mm. surely we get it. Surely we, yeah. uh, but it, not always. Anyway, well, we live from we still live in a very animalistic, material way, which is you know understandable. But you know, animal the animal behavior is based on fear and survival. We don't really need that anymore. But we still we still got it in us, and that's what's that's what's causing us to. To be fearful and aggressive to each other and insecurity. And, uh, I mean, yeah, and uh, we should. Be... You know, I, I mean, I don't want to sound too preachy, but you know, I, I um, the Dalai Lama once said that the the way forward for humanity is unity and diversity. You know, because we have beautiful diversity on this planet. This, the cultures are amazing. There's some amazing stuff goes on in different cultures, but we're not able to, you know, be united at the moment. We're still, and and there's certain people still trying to. I won't name any names, but right. they're they're still trying to separate. Sure, and we don't. And we don't well, that's not the way forward. We, separation will not is devolution. We need to evolve now. We're ready to evolve into the age of light and life. And I've got. A, I'm working on a musical called The Age of Awakening, and I believe we are in the Age of Awakening. Right. But we we're not there yet. <laughs> no. And and you know, we're starting. And and the, the here's here's the great here's the thing. We as musicians, we speak this language mm. which is really the universal language. Yeah. So we can go anywhere on any in any culture and nothing changes. Just like when you walked in and you and I started jamming. I mean, we, <laughs> we were talking. You, Yes, we're talking, we're talking to each we, other. We hadn't so, even said hello yet, practically. <laughs> you didn't need to. <laughs> right. And, and no matter what language you are, what culture, that works. Now, this is this is it. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah, anyway. exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly, you hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Which my mission is to get this, these messages across, which I believe are beneficial to our evolution. 
and get these across through the, the universal language of music. And, that, and luckily I'm able to do it because I have so much experience in music, in sound production, sound shaping, but also arranging and playing. So I'm, I've count myself fortunate. And, and I'm, in a, I'm on a mission, you know. So sure. I think it, you know, uh, people can come and hear me play down at the Wheel Club on Saturday night and uh, check it out. Yep. You'll hear what I'm talking about. Anyway, we can go on for weeks, but yep. let's. What, what I'm going to say is like, there's got to be a, 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 a follow up to this if you have time. And I'll, I'd love to invite you. And I, I really want to thank you for taking the time to. Yeah, well, to, next time I see you, I'll tell you my Led Zeppelin story. So, oh, yeah. and, and, yeah, and I'll tell more. you it now. It says you have to keep that one. Okay, okay. We're going to keep this Led Zeppelin. And, and I, I know there's some, some others I wanted to get to, but this could be an interesting second uh, follow up yeah. to this. I want to really uh, yeah. thank you so much for joining thank me. You. And us and sharing the stories with everyone listening. And as I always say, to be continued. Thanks, Elder. Bye, everybody.